Here we go. All right. So I'll talk about um, some work that I did over, over the summer. Um, ClickHouse is, as I sort of explained at the beginning, ClickHouse is used a lot for uh, both customer facing analytics and internal analytics use cases. And there's these kind of use cases in a lot of different in industries, including like e commerce, retail, for example, web analytics, um, uh, but also uh, finance. So, ClickHouse is used uh, quite often in the financial space, especially for any kind of financial analytics, trading analytics to get fast access to, to data. And there's a lot of data that people usually use in finance. And one of the, of course, most common sources of data in finance is market data. So actually the prices of, um, of, of securities, the prices of stocks, the prices of crypto tokens, the prices of mortgages or fixed income bonds, there's a lot of different types of things, but they all have um, sort of the, the, the same structure. And I did some work over the summer for, for one of our users that basically wanted to get towards the fastest way to serve requests on this kind of, this kind of data. So we're mostly going to talk about market data, which is basically um, this, uh, this data, well, what is described here at the top. So market data is basically, you have things like open prices. So where did, the, where did for example, the stock open at the beginning of the trading day? You have the, the current price um, and, and the price always changes like every, basically every, every tick, like every, every second there's a new price, every millisecond actually. And then it depends on like what kind of granularity in what kind of granularity do you want to get the data? Every once in a while, you get like a volume update, right? So how much, how more was the volume un uh, until to, until this point today, right? Like how many, how many stocks have actually traded? How many transactions have there have there been? So depending on, you might have a very heavily traded stock. You might have something like mortgages that don't get traded very often. So a big difference is here. And th and then at the end of the day, you get something like a close price and and the volume at the end of the day. Um, you have similar type of data sets in other use cases like for example if you get like sensor data from some kind of device or from some factories or something like that you'll get you get similar looking data but instead of having prices and volumes and these things you get things like temperature readings and then some pressure readings and flow rate readings like readings from different sensors for example and it's very similar and the queries will be very similar and the treatment will be very similar or you might even have like just some metrics from some hardware software um basically things like cpu memory sockets, just like a bunch of different things. So all sort of very, very similar type of data. But here we'll focus on, on market data. And so now if you, if you take this kind of like market data set, um, you could do something, something very simple, like just create a table for all of this data, call it ticks, and just have a couple of columns. You have a timestamp column, you have a symbol, so something like AAPL for Apple, you have open price, you have the volume, and you have the last price and you just throw it into a merge tree engine and you order by something like symbol and timestamp. And that's exactly what I did there. So I generated a data set that contains data for 10,000 symbols. Um, it's a bit more than sort of stock market symbols in the US. There's about 5,000 stocks on the US markets, but I generated 10,000 symbols and there's 23,400 seconds in the US trading day. It's, it's a 6.5 hour trading day. So I generated basically data for 10,000 stocks for an entire US trading day. I had to generate this data because it is essentially impossible to get this data. Like the, the stock exchanges around the world make a lot of money these days, not from commission on the trading, but they make a lot of money from the, from the data feeds that they, that they sell to, to third parties, to, like, uh, to people that want to well, need this data um, to trade. And so I generate this data set. And then actually you can optimize this table a little bit further immediately. One thing that you definitely should do is uh, the symbol is going to repeat over and over, right? You'll have, you have 23,400 prices, basically 23,400 rows um, per symbol. So you don't want to store every symbol all over. You want to just have a dictionary encoding. So that's the low cardinality in ClickHouse. So then instead of storing the same symbol over and over, we'll just store basically just a map and we'll just have the list of all symbols. And then we'll have like, a, like the values, like all of the places where that symbol occurs. And something like the open volume and price, um, we can we can make it nullable um, because um, it's actually quite often we will not get all of the prices. Like typically, the way that the stream of data looks like is that we will only get the open price at the beginning of the trading day. Then we will not get any opens anymore. Then and the volume will get infrequently somewhere, and then the price we will get all the time. So like you need to somehow represent that the data 
isn't there for this particular row. Like this row only contains the price or only the open. So let's make it, let's make it nullable. And then we can go and insert all of the data. And so that's what I did. I inserted all of the data. It's a quite good speed, 2.33 million rows. It's just on my laptop, right? So it's not like one of those big servers where you could even do more inserts, but uh, it's quite good speed. And then you end up with like 2.87 gigabyte of data um, on, on disk. And now you can optimize further. So one thing that you can do is you can use encodings in ClickHouse. So if you have a timestamp, also similar to dictionary encoding, it doesn't make sense to store the same timestamp same time over and over because literally for the same second, you're going to have, um, you're going to have that timestamp 10,000 times because you have 10,000 stocks in this data set at least. So instead of storing the same, same timestamp over and over, we'll just uh, choose Delta encoding. So we will only choose the difference between one timestamp and the next timestamp. And quite often the difference is going to be zero. So we don't have to store anything. And then the difference is going to be one second because we have the data every, every one second. So you just store plus one um, and that's it. And you don't have to store anything else. Similarly for prices, they don't move randomly. Um, they are generally in some kind of reasonable range. Most stocks um, have some kind of price range between like um, a $1, a few dollars to like maybe two, $300. There's very few stocks that trade above that. Um, and then typically at some point they do a stock split to, to go further down. If your stock price drops below $1 for an extended period of time, you get delisted in the US. So you better don't do that. Then you do a reverse stock split um, where, you, where you make stock, like you take a bunch of stock and you take them together to get your, your price up again. But um, this will help. So if you put something like this in place and you should really look at doing this kind of optimization, low cardinality codecs in, in everything in ClickHouse. Because if you do that, what happens is your data size on disk can drop quite dramatically. In this case, from 2.8 gigabyte to 1.8 gigabyte. So that's a drop of like, what, 25%, 30% or something like that. And I've lost, and I've, I've lost nothing. I've lost no data. It's the exact same data. I have lost no fidelity, no information. It's just less bytes on disk. And all things being equal, actually, this matters a lot for query speed because query speed will often be limited by how quickly you can read data from disk, as we heard from Xenia in the previous talk, right? Like we, we spend a lot of time optimizing how quickly we can read data from disk. But of course, the quickest way to read data from disk is not to read data at all or to simply read less data, right? So it's, it's, it's very important to, to look into these things. They, they do matter a lot. Um, and anyway, now we have this data. And so what we want to do is um, the requirement in this case was that we basically have all of the market data for all these symbols. And then what we want to do is there's a customer facing application basically where the customers of this user can then go and they can look at for a particular time in the trading day, what was the, the most recent price? What was the most recent open? What was the most recent volume? And so what we can do there in ClickHouse there's this arc max function where basically what we do is we get, we click we look through the data and it will get the most recent open for the highest timestamp. So it will sort of like go back in time until it finds an open price, right? And the open price is only reported at the beginning of the day. So it, it might have to go back quite a lot. But uh, for example, the price, like it probably doesn't really have to go back at all because like it, it finds the most recent price immediately, basically. Um, and so you run this query on this kind of data set with like, uh, with, with, uh, I think that, well, the 240 million rows, I guess. And uh, it takes 0 0.9 seconds. So it's not, it's not that great. Like that's not really like in a customer facing application. You don't really want to want to see that. The throughput is, is quite all right. 10 gigabyte per second, like on a modern disk, you can, you can read like 10, 15 gigabyte per second. So it's not too bad, but still it kind of takes kind of long. So one thing that we can do is we can further optimize. We can get rid of nullable because the way that nullable is implemented in ClickHouse is that we have, we have the files with the actual data for the column, and then we have a separate file that has the information about nullable. And so what we need to do then at query time, if you use nullable, they have to be like joined together basically at, at query time. And so of course that's a, bit, that's a bit slow than if you don't have to do that. So one thing that we can do in this data set is instead of using nullable and using the special null value to represent that there wasn't a value, we can, we can use minus one um, as a representation that there wasn't a value. Like it's like a, it's a sentinel, and it's a sentinel value. Now this doesn't work for every data set, right? So for example, famously, um, some time ago, I think last year, the price for some oil futures fell to below zero. It was negative. And so then if you have a, if you have a sentinel value that's minus one, what if the actual price is minus one? 
But in stocks, at least the price can actually not be minus one. Like I, stocks cannot trade at less than zero because nobody's ever going to buy the stock at you for less than like nobody, nobody's going to give away their 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 stock and then also put money on top right like why would you why would you do that like if it goes to zero it goes to zero you just don't do anything with it you forget about it um and the current market environment actually maybe there's some things that are going to go to zero or that have gone to zero so but they're not going to go to minus one they will only go to zero but uh, you have to you have to be mindful i mean of course like if this was the old price we could have done something like all right let's instead of minus one let's choose like minus 1000 or it's 9999 or some ridiculous value. And then we can put some logic in our ingesting code to make sure that we never ingest that as a real value or something like that. But here, here it works perfectly fine. And so, so with that, our query already gets a bit faster. I mean, what we have to do is we have to change from arc max to arc max if, and then um, only basically read values that are, that are larger than zero or like look for values that are zero or larger. And it makes our query a bit faster. So instead of 0 0.9 seconds, it's, it's 0 0.7 seconds, which is better. It's actually like 20% faster or something like that. But it's still, not, it's still not that good, actually, because what we have here is we have a customer-facing application. So it's not just about how fast is an individual query. It is what happens if you do a lot of queries at the same time. And so we have this tool, ClickHouse Benchmark. It comes with every ClickHouse installation. It comes together with ClickHouse Client. and um, all the, all, the, all the other things that you get when you download ClickHouse. And so there, what we can do is we can, we can basically simulate what happens when we have a lot of users that are running these queries all at, the same, all at the same time. And so if I have this kind of query on all my data and I do all these arc maxes, then if I run it with a concurrency 10, then we can see that our 50th percentile, it's, it's now quite a problem. Like now we're at five seconds and it's only 10 users. Like it's not that many users, right? Like this is actually a global facing application where there might be a lot more users. So if we go to 100, um, 100 concurrent users, okay, now we're at 52 seconds, right? So that's a really big problem. We can only run about 1.92 queries per second. And then anybody wants to guess what happens when we go to 1,000 users, 1,000 uh, concurrency? It will throw. <laughs> It won't even work, right? And I uh, know this says something about cannot allocate threat, right? So I, I haven't looked into whether I could increase the number of threats or something, but basically like this is, this is what happens, right? So um, that's, that's really bad. We want, to, uh, we want to avoid that. So what do we do? Well, one thing that we can do is we can use materialized views. And materialized views in ClickHouse are uh, pre-aggregation. So basically a materialized view is you have, you have a table, the source table, and then you have a destination table and you have a materialized view between the two. And then every time there's an insert into the source table, it will trigger the materialized view and the materialized view will run its usually some kind of aggregation and it will write the result of that into the destination table, so pre-aggregation. And then depending on what query you want to run, you can either query the raw data where you have all of your details, everything, or you can query the materialized view. And so here with this data set, how you can use the materialized view is the real problem with doing this kind of ArcMax queries is that we have to scan a lot of data, right? To find the open price for all the stocks, we have to go back through a lot of data. And so we want to, we want to avoid that. But how do we avoid that? We only get that information once a day. So instead, what we can do, the idea is that we will, we will take snapshots of the data. We will create a materialized view. It takes five minutes. And for every five minutes, we will get the most recent up-to-date information, the most recent open, the most recent volume, the most recent price. And then we never have to go back to all of the data. We only ever have to go back a maximum of five minutes, right? And we could experiment with like how, what the time should be. Maybe it should be 15 minutes, maybe two minutes, maybe one minute, depends on the data set, right? Like, but that's the idea, right? So we have, we have a snapshot and then we have the raw data. And then we basically go pick a random point. And all we have to do is we have to query the materialized view and then the time from the last materialization or the last five minutes, basically, to get, the, to get the data. And the way that the materialized view destination table is going to look like is we, we have these aggregate functions here. So um, to store the actual, uh, to store um, the sort of intermediate states of the, of the aggregates. Um, and we also have an, an aggregated merge tree as an engine because like the materialized view triggers on every insert, but that would just like basically make it write the same thing more or less. So, what we need to do instead is we also want to just like keep aggregating on the destination table to make sure that we only have data for every five minutes eventually. 
And then we create the materialized view itself, right? Like, so we write uh, to the ticks five minutes table that we just created. And what we do is it's basically a select statement. We round, so we go to the start of five minutes um, and um, we store the argmax function state for all of these, um, for all of these, all of these columns. And that will then, when it all runs, when all of it is ingested, it will give us a materialized view that has 790 thousand rows because there are 79 five minute intervals in the US trading day and there's 10,000 symbols. So um, if you do the mass, it's 790,000 um, and it still has, well, 10,000 symbols. And it's very small. So the original table with the optimizations that I did is 1.8 gigabyte, but then the materialized view that snapshots on five minutes is only 7.5 megabytes. That's very small. That's gonna be very easy to query, right? That will probably just be in memory. Um, and so that's really what helps us here. So now we can do a really fast query. If we do this, uh, basically, then we need to do the arcs max merge. So the equivalent is, you can look it up later if you don't know it, but like the arcs max state basically, and then to resolve it from the state to the actual thing, we do arc max merge um, and on the, on the materialized view. And that's a much faster query, 0 0.19 seconds. So quite, quite, quite nice. And if we do a benchmark on that, same thing, 10 iterations, great, 0 0.19. 0.09 seconds, still good. We do 100 concurrent queries, still less than one second, still not too bad. We do 1,000 queries, it doesn't error anymore. 6.6 .6 seconds, okay, now we're getting a bit slow, but like this is just this is just my MacBook, right? Like this is just a single server. So if you actually build a system with 1,000 concurrent users, all right, you, you can't just use a MacBook. You will have to like invest in some serious hardware and like get a few bit of redundancy and replication going, right? Like we just should do anyway for high availability. I wanna guess what happens when you go to 10,000? Iterations. It will break. <laughs> yes, but how? Timeout exceeded. Honestly, I don't even know what happened here, but like something, something happened. Something just like didn't well, finish in time. MacBook is still working. My MacBook is still working. Yeah, it's fine. It didn't crash or anything. Like, I mean, I got the exception, right? So, um, I imagine that it will just burn. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I, yeah, I expected it to explode or something or to just like uh, take up all the memory or something, all the CPU and like freeze the whole thing. But no, it didn't actually. So, uh, good implementation. <laughs> um, uh, by the way, you should run, you should not run a production database on your MacBook, just like in general, right? Because so much other crap is running on there. Like, it's, it's probably not very good. You should have some production service in the cloud. But um, um, anyway. And so, okay, so we have we have we can do super fast queries now and a lot of queries on on the materialized view. But what we need to do now is we need to combine the two together, right? Because like for a specific point in time, we want to combine with the materialized view with the like last five minutes of the of the of the raw data. And so we can do this in this combined query. So uh, we we define the exact point in time at which we want to have the most up to date information, and then we do uh, um, an uh, it's an auto select. And then we have uh, one select query that queries the, the materialized view, the five minute view. And basically um, yeah, just uh, the work condition is like basically the point in time. And then we union all it with uh, a query on the, on the raw data, but we only look at the raw data between um, to start of five minute. So that's basically like now it's, um, it's 728. So this would be 725. Five, because we know that at 725, there, there is a materialized view entry um, and basically now point in time, right? So maximum five minutes that we, um, that we query here. And we run this and it's terrible. I was surprised by this. I didn't expect this. I thought like I was, I was so good. I'd written the perfect query, perfect materialized view. Everything's great, but it wasn't, it was worse. The combined query is worse, but we did the right thing, right? I mean. It's all like restricted, like it's only reading so little data. So what's going on? If you have this kind of problem, if you do query optimization in ClickHouse, what the first thing that you need to do, and 90% of the time, the most important thing that you're gonna do is you need to run the explain command. The explain command is your friend. So you run the explain command and you turn on indexes and it will, it will show you the index usage. So it will show you how much data has ClickHouse actually read from disk, right? And so Xenia sort of uh, touched on this a bit. In ClickHouse, what we do is we store data in granules in chunks of 8,192 values by default. And then there's a sparse index that has entries every 8,192 values. 
And then ClickHouse only ever reads basically that like one full granule, like basic. So for example, if you do select from a table where uh, some unique ID equals something and that only reads one row, well, ClickHouse didn't actually read just one row, right? Like it read more than that. So, and if we, if we, we can use this explain command with indexes turned on to see how many granules did it actually read? How many of these 8,192 chunks? And as we can see, the problem is that this is the material as we write, it only has 97 granules because it's not a lot of data. So it read all of them, okay, sure. But then um, here is the problem. Like we restricted, we have an entire US trading day, 6.5 hours, and we only wanted to read like three minutes, but actually we read like, what's that like a third, more than a third of it, right? So, so what happened? Well, what happened is that is the way we ordered. So it was ordered by symbol and timestamp. Um, and so that made intuitive sense to me because like the symbol is sort of the big item, right? Like, so of course I want all of the data for like, you know, makes sense to have that together. And then, um, you know, I'll have the timestamp as the second one to like order then within the symbol on the timestamp. The problem is that that is not what my query wants, right? Like my query groups by symbol, but doesn't restrict the symbol. So we actually have to go and we have to find, we, we don't just like, read the last three minutes of data like with this, but like we actually read the last three minutes for every single symbol and there's 10,000 symbols. So we have to go into every one of these, for every 10,000 symbols, we have to find where it is on disk, what granule it is in and, and read it from there. And so that's actually not very good for this query. So what we need to do to make this query faster is we can just order by timestamp and timestamp only. And if we do that, then ingestion actually gets faster. Ingestion was like 2.3, 2.4 million or something like that per second. Ingestion is now actually 4 million rows per second. So like our ingest got a bit faster, that's good. But also our queries are much faster. Now we can query uh, in, in only 0 0.2 seconds. That's the, that's the combined query. And then what we can do, and then when we check again, like what is the, what is the index usage now with order by timestamp instead of order by symbol and timestamp, great. It should be the same number of granules, I think, 28,566. 28,566, right here we read over 10,000 granules. Here we read just 185. And that's how we can optimize this. And so then if we do, if we do the same benchmarking, 10 concurrent queries, one second, 100 concurrent queries, 24 seconds, 1,133 seconds, and then I don't think I tested the next one. So basically, um, we get some kind of mix between the two, right? It's not as good as only the materialized view, of course, because you know, there we query no raw data, um, but it's also not nearly as bad as querying all of the raw data. And now what you can do, of course, you can, you can go and you can sort of try to optimize, like was five minutes the right choice? Should it be 10 minutes? Should it be, should it be one minute? Should it be, it, it really depends, right? You can sort of experiment and see if you can, if you, if you can get these values um, to, be, to be a bit better. And so a few sort of takeaways. Um, one, definitely ClickHouse is a good database for these kind of like real-time data feeds. It's kind of real-time data, financial data, sensors, metrics, like any kind of like basically continuous time stream of, 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 a, lot of, of a lot of inserts, of a lot of rows. Um, use materialized views. Now, in general, in ClickHouse, it is developed to be able to do very fast queries on even non-aggregated data. So whereas in many other databases, you have to very quickly do materializations. Uh, because it's, it's otherwise not fast enough. In ClickHouse, that moment in time is usually a bit further, further out. But still, of course, like if you know how you're going to query your data, it makes sense to build materialized views to pre-aggregate and then maybe combine, um, combine the materialized views with the raw data or query only the materialized views. So smart usage of materialized views um, will help a lot. It's very important. Um, sorting key, very, very important. And it's very important to experiment with the sorting key. Try different things, right? Is it, is it, should it be this way around? Should it be the other way around? Should you have this column in there, not this column in there? You should really experiment, especially at the beginning when you get started. There's a new data set that you bring into ClickHouse. Experiment with different sorting keys, right? Don't just, don't just use one and it sort of works and, and that's it, right? Because the difference is, is big. The difference can be really big. Um, one thing that, that helps me personally is that um, oftentimes when I get, when I think about data sets in ClickHouse, I will essentially just take a piece of paper and I will just sort of like write out, like draw out like how the data is going to be stored because it's very simple, right? The sorting key is basically just a sorting key. Basically it's one column, another column, another column. And it's basically just the data comes in and it gets sorted by the first column first and then the second column, then the third column. 
and that's it, right? And then I can sort of like write down, okay, this is gonna be, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then I can think about, okay, so now if I need to execute this query, what will ClickHouse have to do? What data will it have to fetch? Where will it have to fetch it? Can it just read a little bit of data continuously? Does it have to do a lot of different reads all over the place because the data is all over the place, right? So it really depends. By the way, in this example that I had here, um, the reason like timestamp works better is because we don't restrict the symbol. But of course, also you could have queries on this data set where you do restrict the symbol, right? If you pull out your stocks app on your phone, there you look at individual symbols. So there actually, it, it would make sense. The query would perform much better if it is sorted by symbol and timestamp instead of just by timestamp, right? So it depends. And so sometimes what you want to do is you want to actually have two different sorting orders. And you can do that in ClickHouse as well, right? You can have one sorting order defined directly in the table. You can also have another sorting order. You don't even need to have a materialized view for that. You can have a projection. A projection is just another way of storing the data, like either the exact same data in a different order, or you can also store aggregations directly inside the table. And then with the projection, unlike a materialized view, ClickHouse is actually smart enough to know if a query benefits from the projection and should run on the projection or on the, on the, on the, on the original query. And so, um, of course, if you, if you just store your data two different ways with two different sorting keys, the data storage is double, obviously, because it's, it's the same data twice, right? But that's, 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 the question is, is that a worthwhile trade-off? And, and in, in some use cases, the answer will be yes. Let's have double the storage, but we get faster queries. So like we get sort of we, two types of queries will be, will, be, will, be, will be fast at the same time. So it's all about trade-offs. Um, nullable um, is great, but if you really care about performance, don't do nullable because, well, it's a separate file. It requires merging, um, like joining at, at query time. So better not to use it. But in many, in many use cases, in many tables, like it doesn't really matter so much. The, the, the slowdown is not that bad. Um, and, um, and it's easier, as you saw, it's easier to write the queries when you have null. Otherwise, you always have to do like max if. You always have to have if and check if the value is above some value or something like that. Always measure, right? ClickHouse benchmark is really a good tool for that test concurrency as well, because single queries will often behave differently than the same query executed many, many times concurrently. So very good to test, to always test both, or to test what actually the use case is going to be. What's, what is the production use case going to look like? How many concurrent users are there expected to be for what is the system actually designed? And um, lastly, um, as you saw, no matter what I did, eventually the query wouldn't run. And so what you need to do is in your client application that is querying ClickHouse, if it's actually customer facing, you more or less need to implement exponential back off. So if it gets too much, then you need to back off. And basically you need to, you need to stall the user and have him wait a bit longer for the query result so that your ClickHouse doesn't start erroring out and they get errors. So I guess you can expose the errors to the user as well, but maybe it's good to have some exponential back off first to like try to smooth out if there's like a large spike in, in query load. If the spike is sustained, like this doesn't help you, right? Like it's, it's, it's just gonna be too much. But if just a, just a quick spike when all of a sudden something happens, um, like for example, US trading day, like financial data, US trading day start to suddenly every trader is hammering the system, right? Exponential back off and just have them wait a bit longer on, on the queries instead of like getting the results in a few milliseconds, it will take half a second, it will take a second, but at least they will get the results. Any questions? Yes. So basically, you could have time series operations here, mm -hmm. and even though you cannot implement the time series databases in ClickHouse, but did you try to compile it with any of the actual dedicated custom databases that are currently produced? Yeah. So question is, um, if we if we essentially implemented time series use case or a time series database in ClickHouse, and question is, if we've compared that to any other time series database. And the honest answer is no, I work for ClickHouse. <laughs> um, but in this case, I mean, the user, the client, like did look at other databases as well. Um, they have a current system that was based on, on Redis actually, because Redis is just very fast. But actually the, the reason why, they, why they're looking at ClickHouse for this use case is that in Redis, they only had the most up-to-date information. So basically inside Redis, they had these values stored, but so they couldn't go back in time to see like what was the value before and so they was they were exploring how can we get all of this history how can we get a system that is all this history and allows us to query all the history and yeah they could they looked at other databases as well but ClickHouse looked best 
I'm sorry? Redis is not a type series. No, no, Redis is like, uh, Redis is, but it's very, very exactly, right? Like, but like, that's how the data was stored at the moment, but the most recent data, right? If you just want a database that is the most recent data for all, for all stocks, for example, then Redis is a, is a good choice. But then they wanted to go like, all right, now we want all the histories. Now we have to go with a time series database. Um, yeah. By the way, there's a lot of comparisons of ClickHouse versus other time series databases. So if you're ever interested, like ClickHouse versus TimescaleDB, ClickHouse versus InfluxDB, like just Google it. Um, we even have like a whole benchmark issue on, uh, I think, these kind of things. And uh, uh, you can look into that. ClickHouse is not a time series database. It depends on what exactly do you mean. Because <laughs> do you mean that ClickHouse cannot work as a time series database? Do you mean that ClickHouse will show more performance? It no, will be able to do some a lot of additional work in order for it to actually process your time series uh, data efficiently. Yeah, but actually you you have to put it in a different way. Clickhouse is more than time series database. So I all, I'm also saying that Clickhouse is not a time series database because I don't want Clickhouse to to be seen uh, just like a time series database and nothing nothing else. And uh, surprisingly, in many cases. Uh, when uh, users need only time series uh, scenario, they still prefer ClickHouse because it does show better performance. Uh, should we send a link to, to our collection of we have a we have a collection of benchmarks yeah on 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 our website. Um, but uh, what I would say is this, right? I did a lot of optimizations here because this use case was somewhat extreme. Like it was really how can we get hundreds or even thousands of concurrent queries on this data. I think if you choose many of the time series databases and you try to run a thousand concurrent queries, it's just going to fail and there's no way to fix it. Um, but in ClickHouse, you actually do have the way to fix it, right? But in a typical time series use case where you just have, it's just for less queries, it's not this kind of high scale, basically global use case here, you don't need to do these optimizations. You don't need to have the materialized view, right? The first query was fine. It worked in less than a second, right? And that was on a lot of data on basically an entire US trading day, right? Which is typically not really something you will do, right? For example, if you collect um, like uh, metrics or logs or, or just monitoring information or like some, some customer order information or something, you're not, you're not really gonna do that. And even if you're gonna do that, um, you're gonna do that more for sort of internal usage, right? Like if you look across all your customers, for example, that's more like internal usage. Your customers will only look at like a single, their own information, for example, and then you will just query a lot less, a lot less data. But as we say with benchmarks, um, what do you say? Don't confuse benchmarks with benchmarking, right? So always do your own benchmarks, right? Like on your own data set with your own queries and, and you'll see, you'll see. I'm, I'm very confident that ClickHouse is gonna, is gonna do well. But for this benchmark, we did not actually perform any. We just collected benchmarks from GitLab, from CERN, from okay. some, uh, some uh, German institute, whatever we have found. Yeah, yeah, we're very open about benchmarks. Like we're very confident in ClickHouse. We have no clauses in our terms and conditions that say that you cannot you cannot benchmark our database. I think it's always suspicious when people have these clauses, don't you think? Like, what do you have to hide? <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I'm a little bit curious about the, the use case you were mm -hmm. uh, talking about here. Um, was the application really real time or was it like querying historic data or, you know, I'm a little bit interested in the context of, you know, how was this data actually used? Yeah, yeah. So the question is like sort of how was the data actually used? Like what was the actual use case? And so like I I, I can't get into like the, the detailed specifics, but essentially the use case was um, this was a company that is a data provider inside the financial industry. And uh, they're getting all the data from all the, all the exchanges and they're providing some sort of analytic like functionality basically for, 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 for their customers across all of this data. Um, and so it's a customer facing use case. There can actually be a lot of concurrent queries, maybe not like thousands a second, but it can get pretty high and maybe it spikes to something, to something high. Um, and it's, it's, it's a reasonably, it, in this case, it was reasonably simple use case in the sense that it was really querying the market data quickly. It wasn't, it wasn't that enriched, like many other financial use cases, like uh, are, are, are more complex where you have, you have your market data and then you have your portfolio data and your, uh, your trades and you might even have an entire like order book and like then you need to join all of that together to get like some kind of intraday P&L analysis going or something like that. Um, 
that is that, that that's slightly different right like they're like you get into like joints and, and sub queries and how can you optimize all this stuff right but here in this use case it was res relatively straightforward just how can we access historical market data as quickly as possible so i guess it's not real time in the sense that the use case here was not to power um, a real-time trading algorithms for example like if you need to power real-time trading algorithm then you need much faster performance than like one second um, you can do that with clickhouse to an extent if you're actually building algorithmic trading bot, you should probably use some uh, one of these one of specialized financial databases. There's one very popular one starts with a K. Uh, maybe you know it. Like that's maybe what you would use to like develop that algorithm directly. But then the the data um, from that algorithm, the data from the trading for your trading analytics from for your PNL analysis, that's the kind of thing that sort of you can you can do like at your leisure a bit, right? You do have some some wiggle room, right? If the if your PNL like intraday PNL query takes, you know, a few hundred milliseconds longer than you thought, like ah, it's it's it, it's fine. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Um, if you're interested in financial use cases, happy to chat. I, I live in London, so I have a lot of these uh, financial use cases on my plates, uh, banks, hedge funds, uh, lots uh, of crypto cool. platforms. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's 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 chat. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Sure about you. Are they continuous? Yes, question is on materialized views, like how do they work? Um, and basically materialized views are insert triggers on the left-hand side table. So um, they only trigger on inserts, right? They don't, they, they basically, an insert comes into the left-hand side table that will trigger the materialized view. It will not trigger on an insert on the right-hand side tables. It will not trigger on updates and deletes of data. Um, so it's really implemented sort of in a very straightforward way as, uh, as, as insert triggers. You had uh, delta storage of the columns, mm -hmm. but then you introduced uh, storing nulls with minus ones. Yes. What does that destroy um, interesting question. So the question is basically, um, yeah, we had delta storage for the columns, and then uh, we introduced sentinel values of, of minus one. Well, most of the data in this case, I mean, I generate the data, so like I kind of made my own world here, but. Um, most of the data, almost all of the data is actually the price information. Like most of the rows just have the last price. They don't have the open, they don't have the, um, they don't have the volume. And so in that case, it doesn't because the last price is, is, not, is only minus one very, very rarely in the few rows that have opens and volumes. Um, but you're right, in general, this, this, would be something to, this would be something to consider, yes. Yeah, if you have frequent nodes, then it's enough. I mean, it's something to consider for sure, right? Like you should, you should benchmark, you should look at how does nullable perform versus sentinel values, different sorting keys, what's the impact on compression? Um, definitely important, yes. Okay. Yeah. Interesting question. Like question is like, could I have used not a number as a sentinel value and could I have? Yes. Okay, <laughs> I could have. <laughs> What does negative price Yeah, no, not a number is because of floats. Yeah, good point. Yeah. But Great. another question: Why did you choose the float sixty four for prices? Why don't you use the decimal data type? Another good question from from Alexei here. Why why did I not choose uh, the decimal data type instead of float? Um, maybe I should have. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't like. Yeah. Next time I'll uh, I'll 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 look into it. Yes. Do you, is it going to be faster? You think or? Is it? Uh... Yeah, it can be faster because you can even use decimal thirty-two. Okay. Instead right. of float sixty-four. Okay. Yeah, good. Good to know. Next time. Uh, yeah. Just a comment here as well. So, like, if nulls destroy the delta values, doesn't the communication with float and EDM there also destroy? Like, for instance, in, in our use case, we have a lot of repeatable values all the time. It seems that the data basically collapse to a lot of dimensions yeah we have the same value across the entire mm. so changing the code could be dramatically different in the story um good question yeah so basically the question of the comment is like if kind of at the end when i change the sorting key to just be timestamp would that have also increased the storage size um and to be honest i guess i didn't check or i didn't build a slide on it uh with it and and i guess the answer is yeah, quite possibly. Now, in this data set, it's generated. So for the prices, what I basically did is I just did a standard deviation around some midpoint. And so like I'm getting sort of 
actually probably less efficient prices because actually from tick to tick, like the price doesn't change so much, but in a standard deviation random, like when you generate random numbers on a standard deviation, like it can jump around quite a lot. So, um, but, but yeah, in general, I think you're correct. Like it will, it will, it will make it a little bit worse, but I think in general, also on real data, the compression will be better than uh, with code with with the codex than it was for for me on my sort of random data set. Yeah. Uh, what about the limitations of materialized view uh, in this use case, for example? Uh, question is, what are the limitations of materialized views in this use case? Um, what do you mean limitations? Uh, but when you use materialized view, say it increases speed, but uh, does it like uh, limit something else? Like um, right. So, yeah. So, questions like that, any like limits the the materialized view is introduced. Well, we still have the raw data, so you lose nothing, right? You can just ignore the materialized view and query the, the raw the raw data. Now, the materialized view is very specific, right? Like it only did arc max on specific columns, and so if I'd wanted to do something else, like I wanted arc min or something else, I couldn't have done that on the materialized view, right? Then I need to go back and query the raw data and it's a lot of data, so then it would have been slower, right? So materialized views like only work if you know how your data is going to be queried. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>